Welcome to another episode of the Urban Wall Street Project. I'm your host, Earl Christian III, and today I want to talk about a serious nature. Um, of course, if you've been watching our show and following, you know the theme of the Urban Wall Street Project is maximizing the urban dollar and educating the masses of urban America on financial literacy, because unfortunately, financial illiteracy is rampant among our communities that's creating an uh, inability for us to really move forward prosperously in a manner that's conducive for our prosperity. Um, so today I want to talk about education, urban American education. The reality is urban American education or the miseducation of urban America, so if more put. What's really going on in America amongst urban communities? As I think about uh, the statistics and I follow what's going on and, and I do research on urban American youth and our educational system, education among urban American youth off. It's horrible and it's really failing. Um, and I wonder if it's the students, is it the curriculum, is it the administration, or is it the culmination of all of these things? But well, here's the reality, and it's very unfortunate, and it seemingly it's been this way in, in America for a while. In the U.S., we seem to have a culture of poverty, and that culture of poverty seems to suggest that people who are born in poor neighborhoods rarely leave those neighbors, neighborhoods excuse me, for a more prosperous life. So the question I have to ask individuals is this, is it possible for urban Americans to produce prosperity if they are not taught the essential elements necessary? It's, it's, it's wonder because you remember that everything has to be taught. Children learn from their parents. Parents learn from their parents. People learn from society. In urban America, it's seemingly no one is teaching fundamentals of economics, fundamentals of money, the science of money. No one's teaching us uh, some of the, cor the correct ways to, uh, to do things and, and be more producers than consumers. But when you talk about education, you have to recognize something. that Education and the dropout rate amongst urban Americans is staggering. The reality is um, almost 40 percent, almost 40 percent of urban Americans, are youth, are dropping out of school. And that's a serious, serious situation. You know, and, and there's a lot of different realities or, or theories behind why it happens. It's an urban school or they don't go to private school or they don't have the resources. But there's a lot of different things that come into play. And the reality is this. Are the resources there? They may be. They may not be. But a resource without resourceful individuals to disseminate the resources, that can be a reason that causes deficiency. Um, do teachers care? Um, they may care. Um, but remember, it's a two-way street. We have to be much more, um, uh, how should I say, as students, much more studious, much more um, um, about our education. Sadly enough, though, um, as an educator, and I've been an educator, I've come to realize that it's not always the student and it's not always the administration. The sad thing is a lot of the material that we're still teaching our students is very antiquated. And I say that to say this. We're in a whole new time, okay? We're in, we're in a whole new era. We're in a whole new millennium. But a lot of the lessons that are being taught to students in the new millennium seem to parallel lessons I was learning back in the, uh, you know, in, in the 70s and the 80s. And if, my thing is this, how is a community of people supposed to move further if we're learning old, outdated material? I mean, how many times are we going to talk about Christopher Columbus discovering America? There's so many other things that have happened since that time. How many times are we going to talk about the Civil War and the World Wars and all these things that are required? Because I can tell you this honestly, there's a multitude of information I was required to take in high school that to this date I have never, ever really used. And I can't say really, I say really to be modest, but I've never used a lot of it. I'm not going to say that it, hasn't, it wasn't value at that time, but I've never used that information. So if I've never used the information, what was really the point of learning it? Are there not more things that we can learn that could truly put us in positions of prosperity? as we become older individuals, and that's what it's really talking about, because urban America is truly being miseducated. We're being miseducated maybe by our elders, we're being miseducated by the state, we're being miseducated by the country, um, we're just being miseducated and non-educated in a lot of different arenas, um, in a lot of different areas. So I want to talk about it. Understand financial literacy is very important, but before you become financially literate, you have to have a degree of uh, academic literacy. So an urban school, 
what is an urban school? Because we hear it, you know, we hear it a lot, and it's in books. Urban schools are failing. Urban schools have this dropout rate. Urban schools have this type of situation. But what is an urban school, and how does it really differentiate from a non-urban school? Well, some might define an urban school as a school that contains students who are, uh, should I say, socially or academically at risk. And you say socially or academically at risk. Well, what defines at risk? Well, here's a few things that define an at-risk student, according to the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau. Students who are not living with both parents is considered an at-risk student. Students um, where the parent or the head of household um, doesn't have full-time employment or steady employment, that's an at-risk student. Um, students are where the head of the household or parent was a dropout, a high school dropout, that's considered an at-risk student. Uh, families who may be on income, uh, how should I say, not income, public assistance or welfare, who have very low income, and families with no health insurance for the child. Now, I'm an urban American, and I live in urban America, and I know a whole lot of people who fall into at least one of those categories. So when we look at it, we can say almost 75 percent, and those are some of the numbers from the United States uh, Census Bureau, almost 75 percent of urban American youth fall into that category. That means three-fourths of the urban population of students fall into the category of at-risk students. Now, if they're an at-risk student, that seems to mean that they would, might need more resources, uh, more attention, um, and, and, and definitely more support. Is that support readily and available? I believe in some situations it is, but let's talk about it. The miseducation. Just because information is there doesn't mean people are going to get it. Um, in a situation where you have an at-risk student, at-risk to me means that this person is going to need someone to go the extra mile. Is there somebody willing to go the extra mile for urban American youth? Urban Americans, are we willing to go the extra mile for urban American youth? But understand this, the youth are our future. So we don't pay attention to our present and understand what's going on in the present lives of our um, youth then we already know what's going to happen with the future of urban America. It's very important. Understand something. We are not separate. The elders and the youth of urban America, we are all one cohesive unit. You know, I was talking uh, to, my, to, uh, to my mother recently, and she was talking and telling me a fact, and this is in New York City, um, by the chancellor. And I don't know if it's a fact, but she definitely read it, and she's very thorough about it. But this is something to think about urban America, because we see it. And I'm going to say this. Understand that in America, prisons are being built at a ratio of six to one. Six prisons per school. Well, do you know that when a student's in the third grade and the student takes their citywide test, or those tests that are mandated by the state to determine whether they get promoted or go to the next grade or to see where they are academically, do you know also that those, those test results are used to kind of determine how many prisons might be built in the future? Now, I'm not going to digress and go off on a tangent, but that's a serious situation because if you're looking at the productivity of at-risk students and they may not be getting the support, whether it's from their home or whether from the school or whether from any agency that they need to, to move out of the at-risk category or overcome the obstacle of being an at-risk student, and we're, putting, we're, we're looking at that and deciding how many prisons we're going to build, that's a serious situation, urban America. I mean, I've done several um, shows and talked about different, uh, different aspects of why we are where we are and, and who's responsible for urban America. I personally feel that we are responsible for ourselves. It's very important that we understand that. My child is my child. Your child is your child. And the reality is your child is, no, is more important to you than anyone else. So in a situation where you have children or we have communities where our children are the most important things to us, how is that we allow the prime oppressors of our people, or who have been the prime oppressors of our people, to be the primary educators of our children? We have to recognize that, and we have to check ourselves. Urban schools. You know that urban schools have the highest dropout rate of all public school systems in the country. Forty percent of the country's low-income students and 75 percent of its minority students are in public schools or in urban schools. Okay, urban districts um, seem to have the largest numbers when it comes to students with physical, mental, and um, emotional instabilities. So these are a lot of different areas that are affecting our children. 
We have to recognize that and understand what's going on. Can we be more involved? I like to think back to when I was a young person living in Brooklyn. And I remember we had, a, how should I say, it was block associations. And then y'all remember that? We used to have block associations, tenant associations. And when we in those block associations, your family was that entire block. If you were doing something wrong, that person at the corner called your mother. If you were cutting school, that person saw you cutting school, they would let your mother know and you would be dealt with. And I'm sure some of you that can remember that, whether you're from the north, from the south, from the east or the west, I'm sure some of you can relate to that. But I definitely remember some people telling on me. But it was a good thing. So, but it's happened. How we gotten to the point that we no longer are our brother's keeper or we are no longer the village that's raising the children, our children. Are we now dependent upon uh, government agencies and legislation to put in place to be uh, the guidance counselors of our children? I've talked to guidance counselors in the past. I remember talking to a guidance counselor, and this counselor had 600 students. 600 students that she was responsible for. One person. In the school day, there's maybe 180 school days, if that. If that. And if you have 600 students, and you have 180 days of school, how could you see everybody? They're in class. It would seem like it would almost be impossible. The numbers were such in great disproportion that she realized, I cannot see everybody. So if you are the guidance counselor, how can you counsel someone and guide them if you don't see them? And if it's an at-risk student who doesn't get seen by the person who's to guide them and counseling them, do they ever move out of that at-risk status? Probably not. What are we going to do over in America? There's plenty of opportunities out there. Understand something. There are a lot of different government programs that are put into place. Now, you mean, I'm not always been the advocate of government, but heck, we pay taxes or our taxes are, are removed from our checks once we get them. So at some point in time, there is a certain degree of accountability for the government to us, the taxpayer. If you pay taxes, if you work, if you're a productive member of society, then truly you are entitled as a citizen of America. And we have to stand up and start being more commanding of what we re require and respect for our communities, respect for our communities. There are programs for you who are watching that your children can take advantage of. There are programs that you can take advantage of to get your children involved in things. Now, I understand a lot of people might have, you know, uh, their own particular hang-ups about education or, or the school system or what the school does or what the school doesn't do. Well, there's also something called homeschooling. If, in fact, you ever feel that your school is not um, educating and guiding your child properly, you have an option. What's your option? You can homeschool your child. You can take your child by the hand and say, listen, I'm going to educate you myself. I'm going to hold you out of school for a year or two years. There are options. They're not easy, but the options do exist. The reality is this, our students are losing. When in urban America, 40% of students are dropping out, 40%. Graduation rates are at the lowest they've been. And a lot of students think they're going to drop out and get the GED. Well, we have to let our children know that that GED, that good enough diploma, it really isn't good enough. When guidance counselors suggest to our students that, you know, if, you know, you might, you might be better served, you know, taking your GED because school might not be the place for you. We need to check that guidance counselor and get that person removed. Because trust me, I've worked in schools and I've worked with students. Students are being told information like that. Yes, at-risk students, our youth, are being told by counselors that they can't do it or maybe they should consider a GED. Can you believe that? I'm going to counsel you. I'm going to guide you. But I'm going to guide you to take a test that in all actuality, if not looked upon favorably, I give you credit and all those who get credit, as I was a GED instructor. But the reality is, it's not really good enough. You definitely have to go on and move to the next level. So you have to correct that miseducation. Myths. Very a lot of myths in America. A lot of our young people uh, follow the philosophy as, I don't need school, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to play basketball, I'm going to get into the rap game, I'm going to get into whatever the game they may be. But the reality is this. There's always some form of education that's necessary. If you want to be in the entertainment industry, then you better understand and be educated on the business of entertainment. If you want to be an athlete, then you want to be educated on the business of sports, sports and entertainment. 
so that, God forbid, you get an in injury, you can be, do something else beside it, a commentator or something else that's going to show that you have been educated and your mind is equipped and maintains the capacity to do something beside basketball, throw a ball, or dunk a ball. It's real like that. Sadly, everyone is not going to recognize this. Sadly, everybody is not going to understand that we have been miseducated. Sadly, everyone is not going to understand and recognize the necessity and the imperative nature of us starting to educate ourselves and our youth. So what can we do? How can we begin? Is it possible for urban America to educate urban America? Well, I believe it is. And you ask me why? Well, let's think about the 1800s. Let's think about the days of slavery. Who were the primary educators of our children? Slaves. Whether it was up late at night, whether it was with a candle, whether it was with a match, however, under the stars, whatever the case may be, we were educating our children. We were teaching them how to read. We were teaching them how to write because we understood the importance and no one else was teaching us. No one else was teaching that. You know, I wonder if, you know, when segregation came in, when segregation was in place, you know, we always talk about segregation and, and, and integration. I wonder if when we became a more integrated society, our communities became a more miseducated community, or more miseducated society. Because rarely now do I see urban American families providing great um, educational assistance. And when I say that, I say this to me and this, I work with schools. And I had a teacher recently tell me during open school night, 300 students, this teacher has, 300 students, six, six parents came. So if six out of 300 parents are coming to the school to see how my child is doing, to see how their children are doing, what is that saying about the other 294 people? Is the school to believe that these parents don't care? Are the schools to believe that the parents are satisfied with the level of education being stored upon their children? Is the school to believe or the administration to believe that getting a two or a one is okay, that 65s are good enough because I passed. It's not good enough. Why are our children dropping out at record numbers? Why are the graduation rates so low? Is it the student? Is it the school? Is it both? Is it the curriculum? I like to think it might be the curriculum. Now I'm not here to judge or blast, you know, the curriculum and say that it's it's not good or it's not or it's bad. But here's the reality. Over the past ten, fifteen years, urban education, urban youth seems to be uh, uh how should I say, becoming deprecated. It seems to be deteriorating. So if the curriculum that are in place are in in our schools are not producing greater students and greater scholars then, in my opinion, seems like there's something wrong with the curriculum. You know, if it, they say if, it, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, our, our students are broke. This system is broken because our, it's not working for our students. It's not giving them what they need. It's creating imbalanced youth, an imbalanced perception of what education is, an imbalanced perception of what they need to be focusing on in school. And if it's broken, then it must be fixed. Now. I asked earlier, how can we fix it? Well, the reality is this. What if the system doesn't want to fix it? What if it is how it is because that's how it's supposed to be for the, for the purposes of those who seek to keep urban youth at a certain situation? Understand, these are just my opinions, things that I think about. But every single person in urban America, if you're a parent, you're a teacher, an administrator, if you care, if you have two cents, about our youth, our students. You look around, you realize there's a serious problem. But what are we doing? Are we writing to congressmen? Are we calling our elected officials, our selected officials? Are we up in the schools commanding a change? Are we sim simply shipping our children off day in and day out, hoping that everything is going to be all right? I'm going to tell you something. Hope is not a plan. Because if you hope to pass a test and you don't study, you're not going to pass it. If you hope to get a job and you don't go look for one, you're not going to find one. If you hope 
to have a good marriage, but you're an infidel, you probably won't have a good marriage. So understand that hope is a non-action verb. So beyond hope, we have to couple hope with action. We have to be very much involved directly. And now that comes with something else that I talk about, being proactive or reactive. When it comes to our education, no longer can urban America afford to be reactive. You know, reactive is people who kind of sit back and when things happen, they, they let their conditions and their environment dictate their behavior. Reactive. I'm going to let my condition and my environment dictate my behavior. Proactive. I, my behavior is going to be uh, predicated on what I feel and what I want to do and not so much my environment. If my environment is saying one thing, I'm going to do something irrespective to show that I'm, I'm trying to take it to another level. It's very important that we need that. That we, and that we do this. That's the reality. Urban American youth are dropping in record numbers and they're losing. And I look in the face of some of these young people daily. And I see the yearning. I see them wanting to learn. But I'm going to tell you, my brothers and sisters, if you're not a teacher, if you're a parent, if you're an aunt and your uncle, and you're not involved in your youths, uh, in your community, whether it's your nephew, your daughter, your son, you really have to get involved. Because the system is not changing for the betterment. And once again, I'm not going to say that in all systems. I'm, you know, here in New York City, where we, where we broadcast from, the numbers are serious. You know, in 2005, there was a 43.5% graduation rate. I mean, less than 50% of minorities were graduating from high school. Less than 50%. So the reality is, these, these individuals are almost doomed to a lifetime of poverty. But they don't see it. Because what are they being educated on? iPods, iTunes, downloads, sneakers, all these tangible things that have no bearing on their mindset or a mindset that would breed prosperity. Families start recognizing the need to get involved. Youth start listening to those who've come before you. We've all grown up in, in neighborhoods and hoods where, you know, we grew up and we thought somebody was cool. I ask this sometimes when I counsel young kids and they seem like, you know, they don't want to do the work and they think life is going to be great and their education is not so important. Or what this person told them, what that teacher told them, that's what it was and that's all they need to know. Well, I ask them sometimes, I said, have you ever, when you were six or seven or maybe eight or nine, you know, nine or ten years old, in your hood, in your hood, you was walking around and you saw somebody else, like maybe 16, 17, you thought they were the man, they were that person. But now you're a little bit older and you see that person still chilling on the block, still doing the same things. Do they have the same effect on you? Do you still see them in the same light? Many of them say no. And I say, why? And they say, because they're not doing anything. I said, so what has changed? Have they changed over the past five years or has your perception changed? And it's their perception. They recognize now that this person is not really doing anything productive. So as where I was once idolizing this person, I realized this person is not to be idolized. Earlier on, this person was miseducated, misled by this particular individual, but that, that, that person was what they wanted to become, and it's not. I'm not going to sit here and profess to know all the answers to correct urban American educational system. I'm not going to sit here and suggest and profess that the educational system doesn't work. I myself am a product of the public school system. Some of my, some of my friends went on to college. Some of my friends didn't. Some of my friends listened to their parents. Some of my friends didn't. Some listened to the guidance counselors. Some didn't. And the list goes on. The reality is this. Your education, urban America, is up to you. I'm going to say that again. Your education, urban American, youth, is up to you. Do not let your future be dictated by those who are not from your community. Do not let your future be dictated by those who seek to see you at a minimum wage job. Do not be a reactive person. Be proactive. Don't wait for something to happen and then try to work around it or work with it or just say, well, that's just how it is. Be proactive. See things head on. Meet things head on. Don't be afraid to read a book if you only read the newspaper every day. Stay informed. Know what's going on in your community. I'm not even saying you got to know what's going on across the country. No matter what city you're in, whether you're in Atlanta, whether you're in New York, whether you're in Chicago, whether you're in California, be mindful of the educational system 
pay attention. Because young brothers and sisters, it's really, really important. It's only but so much myself or your teachers or your parents can do. But it's very important that you understand your future and your life. And if they say education is the key, you want to have a key ring loaded with keys. You don't want your pockets to not be jingled. If you don't have the key, that means you're locked out. And that's real. Urban America, we can no longer be afforded to be locked out. We are now in the new millennium. Things are changing. We are in the information age. Technology is growing and evolving in, in unimaginable ways. There's a variety of ways to start educating yourselves. If you feel that you're not getting what you deserve from your school system, recognize this. The school system is probably not going to change. If you feel that your teachers don't give you the support, recognize they may not. And not because they don't want to. Maybe they don't know how necessarily to give support. Because remember, naughty by nature. Tretch had a song back in the day. If you ain't ever been to the ghetto, stay up out of the ghetto because you wouldn't understand the ghetto. Now that might be, you know, eloquent for that particular time and age, but it's real. Everyone can't teach urban American kids because you have to understand what they're going through. You have to understand the social ills. You have to understand the emotional ills. You have to understand the street ills. And if you don't understand them, it's going to be very hard to relate. But who can relate to urban youth? Urban elders. Be mindful. Our education is the only thing we have to get us up out of this turmoil that we're in. Be very conscious of what you do. Understand that the process of education is always greater than the product. Okay? You've been watching the Urban Wall Street Project. I'm your host, Earl Christian III. I hope you've learned something. Remember, a mind truly is a terrible thing to waste. And anything your mind can conceive, you can achieve. Be blessed. Until next time, peace.